welcome to Off the Page, the show where we talk with Colorado authors to get the story behind the story. I'm Stacy McKenzie, a librarian here at Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Public Library in Broomfield, and today we have an author who's not really a Colorado author, but he wrote about a wonderful place we have here in Colorado. He wrote about Magic Mountain. He's also got a book called Pleasure Island and one about Freedom Land. We're going to find out what all of those things are when we talk with Bob McLaughlin. Hello, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you. And we'll say Robert McLaughlin, so we know that that's the name of the title that people can find the books through. But I'm going to call you Bob. Is that okay? That's what my mother called me. Yeah, okay. That works out great. So what we're talking about today are theme parks, amusement parks. What is a better term? Uh, be theme parks. Theme parks. So we have different themes for each of the three that we're going to talk today. And when people talk about theme parks, we often think of Disneyland. Correct. So let's start with what everybody knows. Disneyland. Is, was that the first theme park? Yeah. Um, amusement parks actually started around the turn of the century. We call them trolley parks. Of course, they were there before that, but the, the trolley parks were actually built uh, at the end of the trolley lines to shore up the revenue for the trolley companies who were paying for electricity, even though they weren't. Uh, nobody was using those trolleys on weekends. <laughs> so they would build a park at the end of the trolley line and uh, and utilize those, uh, you know, and then everybody would go to the trolley parks on the weekends and then, uh, you know, the trolley companies were making money seven days a week. Wow. And then we went into, and then more, more, a lot of those parks evolved into the traditional parks that we know of today, like out in Sandusky, you see the point, was a trolley park, okay. uh, for instance. And, uh, but boy, I'll tell you, everything changed with Walt Disney back, uh, back around 1953. Uh -huh. Uh, they decided they were going to build something completely different. And uh, of course, trolley parks were always built either on the ocean, or most of the parks were built on the oceans or by a lake or something like that. Walt Disney changed the rules. They built this thing in the middle of a bunch of fields. And uh, so they created their own lakes or their own mountains. And, uh, and that, that really set the trend for, you know, for what we call now theme parks. So as we go forward and we're talking about your parks, uh, that, that you studied, um, we're going to be bringing up a word that's not Disney, C.V. Wood. Correct. Tell me about who was C.V. Wood. C.V. Wood was working in Los Angeles for the Stanford Research Institute uh, when Walt and Roy were looking for a location to build their park and how to build it and who to hire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so C.V. Wood was running the team for that, for that particular project, that endeavor for Stanford Research. Walt and Roy were very happy with the study that they finally came out with and hired C.V. Wood as their very first vice president. Uh, and uh, C.V. Wood was really involved with most of the aspects, many of the aspects of putting Disneyland together. He was very, like I said, very first vice president. Yeah. And uh, boy, he was very young. He was early. He was only 35 when Disneyland opened up. And uh, so he, uh, he was uh, <clears throat> actually the very first general manager of Disneyland after it opened up also. Subsequently, he had a personality issue with Walt Disney. They both did very, very, you know, very high heeled and, uh, you know, you know uh, very strong, very strong personalities, both of them. A lot of conflicts. Uh, some other stuff came down, and, uh, you know, and it was really kind of interesting. Can I just show this one book about this? Sure. Because this will really explain a lot of it. A friend of mine wrote this book right here. Uh -huh. It's called Three Years in Wonderland by. Uh, excuse me, Todd James Pierce, uh -huh. just came out uh, in March, I believe. Uh -huh. It's almost 300 pages. And it basically lays out the whole story about C.V. Wood and Walt and Roy and how they put Disneyland together and all the stuff that it took to get through there. Very, very hard project to get through. And, uh, but it's a great book. And of course, that at the ending of that book is really the beginning of our books because C.V. Wood, he got let go from Walt Disney, Roy and, and, and Walt, particularly Walt, let him go after Disneyland opened up months after that park opened. Mm -hmm. And C.V. Wood started a company called Marco Engineering mm -hmm. and uh, to go out and be a consultant, basically, and to go out there. And if you're an investor anywhere in the country, uh, you would, uh, you know, they would come in with a whole team and they would design your park. They would do the market survey. Uh, they'd even run it for the first season. There was a whole, co there was a whole, whole concept for these guys, and they wanted to build 20 or 30 of these, you know, uh, parks across the across the country. Mm -hmm. So basically, you'd have your regional Disneyland's because most of us, including myself, you know, when we were growing up, we were never going to get to Disneyland. You know, so that's where that's where C.V. Wood and Marco, uh -huh. uh, that's where he got his start. Okay. This is fascinating. It's, now, oh, it's a great story. As you've been mentioning, you know, things like 
the marketing plan. Mm -hmm. I've been noticing that you are not, we mentioned you weren't from Colorado. Yes. You have a lovely accent. Where well, are you. you from? Well, I, I was born in Ipswich, Massachusetts. I grew up in Lynn, which is a couple of towns over from Wakefield, Massachusetts, where I live now. Uh -huh. And my wife and I, and uh, we've got four kids, five grandchildren. Uh, we've lived in Wakefield for about 30 something years now. And, uh, and literally, enough, oddly enough, Wakefield just happens to be home of Pleasure Island, which was the park that came in right after Magic Mountain, okay. also designed by Marco Engineering. And what got you to, to, to be to a point where you're going to write a book? What was the impetus for all of this, these wonderful books? Well, you know, I didn't get up in the morning and said, gee, I think I'm just going to write a book. Mm -hmm. uh, it all started out very innocently uh, in 2000, in March of 2000, uh, I was on the planning board in Wakefield and I went to, the, uh, went to a little church antique show to get a painting for a, uh, uh, one of our members that was leaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, all our board members were going to sign it. So I was waiting in line, I was looking at some postcards a guy was selling and I came across a set of postcards. Uh, Pleasure Island postcards. Uh -huh. And I go, uh huh, why don't we just, I uh, had a friend of mine who had a computer home based business and I says, you know, Cor I called her up and I says, Corey, I got some postcards from Pleasure Island. Why don't you come over and we'll blow them up on your computer and I'll put them on the information stations around Lake Quantapow. Uh -huh. Meantime, I'll get a little information on it. That's literally how the whole thing started. Uh -huh. Nine postcards, and uh, 16 years later, in five books, here we are. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. From postcards. Exactly. That's exciting. And from the postcards, yes. um, there's a, an organization now, a group formed? Well, we got, uh, uh, again, the whole thing just kind of started and it kind of snowballed, but uh, we, uh, I was able to find uh, a guy named by, by, his name is Bill Hawks, uh, lived up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that really wanted, he was the guy that put Pleasure Island together. He was the one that hired, he got the investors together, they hired Marco Engineering. Uh, they, they combined with, with a company called Capit, Capit and Forbes that actually owned the land, plus a construction company to build the park. The three of those guys joined forces. I was able to find Bill Hawks just through the phone book. Uh, there, was, there was a couple of Hawkses up there and I just kept on dialing until I get the right one. Uh -huh. And uh, his wife answers the phone, and, uh, and uh, one thing led to another. They ended up donating their entire collection to us. And because of that, uh, Corey and I created a 5013C to receive this. They got a tax write-off, and we got some really cool stuff, uh, including stuff for Magic Mountain and uh, 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 Freedom Land, oh, wow. uh, uh, wreckage and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And uh, so that's, where the, that's how Friends of Pleasure Island started, and it still exists today. That's, that's amazing. That's and I get marvelous. to be president because I started it. Yeah, you get to be president. <laughs> that's marvelous. So let's talk about your first book, Pleasure Island. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how you decided to create a book and how you put it all together. Well, uh, um, first of all, I, when I first got into this thing, I just assumed there was a book. And I started going oh. to libraries or at least magazine articles or something and I couldn't find anything. Nobody had ever done the history of Pleasure Island, which is kind of weird, but that's what I, that's what I found. So uh, I started poking around. I asked a couple of guys that I didn't know that, uh, that, you know, that have, you know, Disney websites or something like that, you know, if they'd be interested in writing a book and I'd, I'd, I'd feed them the information. I have dyslexia, I have a real problem writing anything, even a letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably the last person on the planet that should ever be writing a book, but I, you know, I, I know how to lay it out and all the other stuff, but just physically going onto a keypad just doesn't work. I have to hand print sure. everything, something. So it was just, it just takes a lot longer, but you can get it done. Yeah. And uh, so I had a couple of guys that were gonna do that and, then, and they just stalled it, you know, they're, you know, a year, year and a half later and I'm trying to do interviews and we were literally losing people. I mean, people were, you know, getting elderly and, uh, you know, and I'm losing these oh. interviews. Yeah. So I just sucked it up and I, I called back Katie or uh, publishing mm -hmm. and I says, you know, I've had several of the books over the years and I says, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a book on Pleasure Island. I, you know, we filled out the application form, went through the whole review process and uh, voila, uh, pleasure, my first Pleasure Island book with, uh, with Images of America came out in 2009 for the 50th anniversary of Pleasure Island. And uh, so then because I did that one, and uh, since Pleasure Island was back to back with Freedom Land, which was the third park after Magic Mountain out uh -huh. in the Bronx, I decided to do a book for, the, for their 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Hooked up with a guy out in, uh, out, out in the Bronx that had a bunch of photographs that he got when, they park, when the park shut down. They were all in-house uh, photos. And uh, that was also Images of America. That was my second book. Uh -huh. And then, uh, then, then I was off to Magic Mountain. Yeah, Magic Mountain. Let's talk about, so the order of your books is actually different than the order of Correct. of how they were built. So explain the order of 
the theme parks being built. Okay, uh, when uh, Marco Engineering first started up, you know, their first commission, Royal Commission, they were doing some other stuff and they were involved in uh, a whole bunch of different different other industries, let's put it this way, but this was this was the main one. Um, right around the same time Disneyland, uh, you know, uh, opened up, there was a guy down there, uh, actually right here, Wheat Ridge, Colorado, uh -huh. and uh, by the name of Francis Cobb, he was a plumbing contractor. He wanted to build a children's recreation park, really like kids, I mean, and just absolutely wanted to build a children's park, which were being built all over the country, like a mother goose park, you know, with a big Paul Bunyan or a, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of different concepts, but it, that was the park. It, was not gonna, it wasn't gonna be a Disneyland park, but this is, and he had a friend, John Sutton, who was a, who, he was an artist and a designer, and uh, so those two guys put this park, they put this package together, Magic Mountain Incorporated. They had a board of directors, and I don't know exactly how it happened. I don't think any, well, I honestly don't know how it happened, but somehow or other, they connected with Marco Engineering. Okay. There was a connection. And, uh, and, uh, and the next thing you know, this park went from a storybook park to a Disneyland type park. And it was gonna be the first one in the entire country after Disneyland, and it was. I mean, it was clearly, clearly designed uh, to be absolutely, without a doubt, a Disneyland type park, no doubt about it. And that was the first one. And, and that was uh, which year? And that was 1957 when this all happened. Seven. If anybody knows where Rolling Hills Country Club is, uh -huh. that's where that park was originally going to be built. That was that they bought that land, and that's that was the original site for Magic Mountain. That was uh -huh. called Parcel One, and Applewood uh, was uh, was a subdivision at, at that time. And Applewood, the residents in Applewood, met at the Rolling Hills Country Club, which is now Applewood Country Club. Yeah. And they had a big meeting one night, right after this, after the announcement. And they said, "You know what? We don't want that traffic. We don't want the Disney traffic. You know, you know, messing up our lives. You know, we we don't want this period." So uh, what happened was Cobb and his guys, they didn't want, they didn't need the 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 the, the time lag it was going to take to fight this. So they just bought a 600-acre ranch outside of Golden, out to the west, which is where currently uh, Heritage Square sits. But that was originally the Magic Mountain site, 600 acres, and uh, and they started building that in '57, with the attempt to get it open by '58. That was the that was the attempt. It never happened, you know. They and of course at the same time they're building it, they're also raising money one dollar at a time by selling stock. To, uh, to but you had to be from Colorado because the Hathaway Hathaway company that was doing this was only licensed to sell stock in Colorado. And uh, so consequently, but they did end up, they, they sold almost $3 million, about $3.5 million uh, worth of stock for this, for this project. A lot in 57. And uh, they started, and they continued construction through 58, uh, didn't get, the, didn't open, they const constructed all the way through, I mean all the way through, but even by the, by the, by the 1960 season that they officially opened, you mm -hmm. know, where, where they were open seven days a week, uh, it, it only lasted that one season. Wow. It was, it was a wow. Wow, mm -hmm. only one season. Yeah, uh, they wow. opened a, the, they, they got the train running in 50, actually in 58 they had some of the stuff going, uh, you know, and they would they would open the park up on weekends for investors to come in, uh, you know, and uh, poke around and uh, basically they had salesmen up there trying to sell stock. So they'd l open it up on weekends and people could go up there and actually see how this thing is being built. Completely different from Disneyland, where they opened the, they opened the park up. It was hypothetically it was supposed to be all done, you know. But uh, at least uh, you know at least uh, you know they could get the park open on that one year uh, schedule. But not Magic Mountain. It was completely uh, it was it was just very difficult for these guys to do this. And they had management changes, and they had a bunch of different you know, ownerships and stuff. But uh, but they did get the train running up and running on July fourth. Big, big train, uh, three foot narrow gauge, 7,500 feet of track, had a big dog leg at one, it, it, not like people realize that at Heritage Square, it was twice as long because it went all the way around on the other side that you can't see. And uh, so that was the, uh, you know, that was the, that was the, uh, that was the, that was the story. It just, uh, it literally, it shut down Labor Day week in 1960. What was the next um, theme park of our three that we're talking about? Well, Pleasure Island, uh, they started building Pleasure Island in 1958. All this was going, same Marco Engineering. Uh, you know, Bill Hawks, again, uh, out in, out in, uh, uh, from Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, they, his park was originally going to be Child Life World, very much, very mirrors uh, the, the Cobb, uh, you know, uh, uh -huh. concept where he was going to build like a Child Life park, a Storyland type, type of a park called Child Life World, and uh, and again he hooked up with with C. V. Wood, uh -huh. and again uh, the thread that was going across here was C. V. Wood was, was he, you know, they were they were doing two things. They were giving him cost estimates to build the park, which were unrealistic. 
Okay. And uh, so, but these these guys didn't know because they're talking to the expert. This is the guy that built Disneyland. So oh. he they just assuming that you know he knows exactly what's going on. But and then the other thing was is the number of people that were projected to come to the parks. You know, and uh, they were they were they were way off. You know, so overinflated, and uh, so consequently, Pleasure Island went bankrupt the very first season. It opened it opened uh, in uh, 1959. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, uh, June 22nd, quite frankly, and <laughs> and it was way over budget, and uh, you know, so consequently, they resold the park. It went into bankruptcy. Some guys grabbed it for 20 cents on the dollar, but those the next three years, when those guys owned it, uh -huh. it was one of the three top grossing parks in the entire country. Pleasure Island was kicking, it was cooking. They opened up with the Three Stooges in 1960. Uh, they had Ricky Nelson there. They had everybody and their brother was was playing there. All the big bands were over there. It was crazy. Plus they had a big plastic whale. It was a big Moby Dick, 50 foot whale, came charging <laughs> out of the water. You, you, you know, they, all the kids and the guys were on whale boats. And of course, all the narration, the scaring the heck out of everybody. It was pretty cool with a couple of dark rides. But it mirrored a lot of the stuff that was, was either at Magic Mountain or didn't get built at Magic Mountain, they brought out the Pleasure Island. And then, of course, the third park was Freedom Land, which opened in 1960, and that was the biggest park in the country, bigger than Disneyland. Oh. 85 acres on a 205 acre site, and they took the entire country and shrunk it to 85 acres, and you walked through 200 years of history. It was bro broken down into seven different regions. They had music themed out for the whole thing, they had everybody in costumes. And if you were a kid, you literally walked through 200 years of history. You went through little old New York, you went through little, uh, you went through Chicago, you actually put out a fire, you want a stern whirler, uh, you went out to the Great Plains, there's Colorado folks, a little plug, they had they actually had the, they had they actually had some cattle out there. And oh, then then you went up to the northwest and you went on that boat ride, uh, which is the equivalent of the jungle ride, which play, like Freedom Land was supposed to have, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. Magic Mountain was supposed to have, and they, they had $450,000 into that river ride over to Magic Mountain that was never completed, you know, unfortunately. But uh, as a matter of fact, some of that animation actually ended up out at Freedom Land. And then you went down to San Francisco, you went down to, uh, oh, it was great. You went around the whole country, you know, and you, you landed in the future uh, down, in the, down in, the, uh, in the Florida region, and it was all geared to the space industry. And they had, they, they had the Moon Bowl, they had, oh, it was just crazy. And, uh, but all three parks, uh, you know, uh, Freedom Land lasted uh, five years, and then it went in the dumpster, five seasons. A uh, lot of money. And then uh, Pleasure Island was the one that lasted the longest. That went for 11 seasons. It went through four different owners, you know. And then, of course, then we go back to Magic Mountain, which sat there for about three years, uh, you know, while they were trying to fool around with what, how are we going to do They had all these liens, construction liens, and uh, it was just crazy. And uh, so by 1963, that park was auctioned off. Uh, the land, the 600 acres, was busted up into five different parcels, uh, and one of the parcels with the improvements, that was Magic Mountain, mm -hmm. um, you know, that got bought by uh, some guys out of uh, Phoenix that was building, had built another park called Legend City, mm -hmm. and, um, and that didn't work out because Legend City didn't work out, so by 1971, finally Heritage Square, you know, took over. And what about Heritage Square? Are you going to write a book about Heritage Square? You're darn right I am, yeah. and, I need, and I need some help, boys and Wonderful. girls. Okay, So I want everybody to get out of their basements and get uh -huh. out those boxes of photographs. I know you have, and, yes. uh, and help Uncle Bob out, because that's how we're going to do it. And that's exactly how we did, uh, that's, that's how I was able to gather photographs and information for Magic Mountain, was with a lot of help from a lot of different people. And Magic Mountain, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, know, you know, fortunately, Magic Mountain, even though it didn't quite succeed, it really, if we didn't have Magic Mountain and in, 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 in the foresight that, that, that Francis Cobb had, we wouldn't have never had a Heritage Square. And if we didn't have a Heritage Square, we wouldn't have 45 years of seasons up there wow. with an opportunity for an awful lot of people to own their own businesses an opportunity for a lot of kids to work up there at that park, mm -hmm. an opportunity for an awful lot of people to go out, or go on the Alpine Slide. I mean, you know, just you name it. And just to be clear, the park is not closed. Heritage Square is closed, but the amusement park, Heritage Amusement Park is, is in the Garden Grill. They're open till 2039, because that's where their lease runs. That's so it's enough. not completely closed. That's good, clarify that, it's not completely closed. Exactly, exactly. Well, if someone did have um, something they wanted to get to you or some information about Heritage Square, could they 
contact you through your website? Yes, uh, if you go to my website, right on our homepage, uh, we have got uh, all my contact uh, information, uh, uh, either email, I love to talk to people, just call me on my cell phone. You know, three o'clock in the morning is fine, I've got nothing to do, just give me a call, and uh, any anytime, seriously. You're uh, dedicated. Uh, yeah, we're dedicated. We, yeah. uh, we're, uh, in, I, I plan on coming out at least a couple of times for that, uh, for that project, quite yeah. frankly. Well, great. Well, I hope you love Colorado and you'll come back and visit. We love Colorado. Plenty. This is my ninth trip out here. And wow. uh, it's, I mean, you know, I'm telling you, we love this place. Uh -huh. Tell me a little bit about all the research that you had to put into these books. I'll tell you, when you're researching, uh, you know, well, number one, I didn't go to school for this. You, you know, number one, I'm a electrician, right? I graduated oh. from vocational school, you know, went right straight to work, was on the CBs for a couple of years, and then just, uh, and, so I've been an electrician all my life. Uh, I didn't go to school to be an historian. So this has oh. just been a real passion. It's a lot of fun. It's literally like CS, CSI. It's like opening up, uh, you know, and just looking in and trying to, trying to figure out how did all this stuff happen, and then trying to figure out you know how do how do, how do you how do you pull this together and how do you find all this information? One of the things I did was I I, I started by eBay has been a wonderful thing, not too good for my pocketbook, but it's been a lot of fun to pick this stuff up. There's a business uh, business amusement magazine uh, that uh, Billboard put out, uh, lots and lots of information, so I was able to pick up a lot of those on eBay, and uh, that's really been a big help. Microfilm has been uh, you know I go to the libraries. I spent an awful lot of time in Denver at the over at the Western Collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that's another way of getting it. And then of course, um, you know, uh, searching for uh, ver various people that I know through microfilm uh, um, that uh, you know maybe they're around, maybe they're not. And I've got a hold of a lot of people. And uh, you know, and then you know, literally flying around uh, when I have to, uh, I bring my camcorder with me, and we do interviews. So it's a combination of interviews. And of course, when you're interviewing, sometimes you actually know what the answers are because you have it. You know, you have it right right on microfilm. But then you just you, you just basically it's like a double source, you know. So you get it, you know, you get it right out of the horse's mouth, and uh, well, it's really exciting. Magic Mountain was the toughest one out of the three parks. Oh yeah, why mm -hmm. is that? Because uh, just the mere fact that uh, <clears throat> the park had such a short life, you know, trying to get a hold of photographs. And uh, and uh, it was just uh, they came from a lot of different sources. I have to I, I have to tell you, uh, Leroy Allen, who is a deputy marshal up at the park, mm -hmm. and Monty Pike, who was a marshal, and also he was the assistant to to uh, to uh, Francis Cobb from the get go. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, they had a wealth of information and photographs that I was able to access. So about a quarter of the photos that in Magic Mountain came from that collection. And uh, and we've also got a guy. I mean, I took a train ride up there at Heritage Square. Mm -hmm. Talked to Rich Purcell. He was driving the train. He's been doing it for like eight. He was doing it for eight years up there. Rich, do anybody that's got any photos? Oh, I know a guy out in California that might have some. His dad took some, and we got a bunch of them. And the cover, the photo on the cover, came from that conversation. And uh, it was just you could do a book about writing a book about trying to find this stuff. And you, but you put it all together, lay it all out in a storyline, and uh, and voila, there you, that, there you go. The the books do have so many images in it. It's, it's, it really gives you such a, a great visual that you can get a little more into the parks. So did you have people donate these pictures? Did you just find them? Well, again, some of them were donated. Uh, some of them I bought licenses for. Uh, okay. You know, in other words, the Denver oh. Public Library, you know, the Western mm -hmm. Collection, they had some in their collection. You know, for a nominal fee, you mm -hmm. know, you can buy a license for those. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I got some from a, from another outfit in, outfit in California that had some great uh, train photographs. We have an we have a whole chapter just on trains in here. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, so I was able to get those. Uh, eBay for free, my Freedom Land book about probably. 50 60 percent of those photos I got on eBay wow. uh, for the free for the uh, for the for the uh, my Pleasure Island book and I just have to tell you that I that my Pleasure Island and my Freedom Land book those are my second books because this is a different these are these are in color my first two books were in black and white yes. right so this is a completely different series that oh, just came out so in January better. yeah I know tell me about it it's real, they, they, <laughs> they look terrific and uh, so uh, I was able to I got a phone call that's why my second book from Pleasure Island really came out I got a, a random phone call from the people that own the camera shop at Pleasure Island for three years for the first three years they were the official photographer for, for Pleasure Island 
and I get this random phone call, hey, we're moving, we got a bunch of stuff we want to get rid of, are you interested? And I went over there, and I bought, you know those things that you stick your heads through, at the, and, uh -huh. you know, you know and, uh -huh. and, and you just, people take their pictures, I bought all those that they had what? from Pleasure Island, which was really cool, because I mean, How you know, a little bit, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people stuck their heads oh, through yeah. those. <laughs> and, uh, and then also, but they also had, I, I bought about 700 negatives. You know, they didn't know what they were selling, I didn't know what I was buying, I just went over there with some cash, and we just walked out the door, and I'm going like, wow. And I started to look at these negatives, and I'm going, this is great. And these are photos that I didn't have when I did my first book. So I called my editor up. I says, has anybody ever done a book on the same subject, you know, like twice? Mm -hmm. And uh, they says, well, not necessarily, but, you know, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it for you. And uh, they let me, you know, we went through the process, and they let me do it. And then the, at the, right around the same time, they were coming out with this, with this color version, Images of Latin America, uh -huh. or Modern Images of America, depending on what my deluxe is going today. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, uh, we ended up doing that. You know, I did that book on Pleasure Island mm -hmm. because I did that one. I decided to go back, revisit Freedom Land, and do that one in color. Yeah. And then, and then, and that's the, the order's a little scrambled. And then I went back and did Magic Mountain. Ah, so I see. And so, thank you. A lot of people want to thank you for doing this book on Magic Mountain. Well, you're very welcome. And we will be extremely excited about Heritage Square. Because Heritage Square had 45 seasons and these others had a smaller, uh, shorter seasons, how, are, how is this approach going to be different? Well, um, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's more recent, more recent history right, for starters. Yes, for you sure. know, very recent. Uh, we're, I mean, we're starting 1971, but we're really actually sort of dipping back into the Magic Mountain, because again, Magic Mountain was the, was the uh, you know, was the bones to, the, to Heritage Square. Okay. Um, and it's going to be kind of interesting because Heritage Square had been flipped several different times, lots of different owners. Mm -hmm. So I have to see if we can weed through that. We had two generations of trains at Heritage Square. Uh, we had a two gauge, narrow gauge railroad, and we also had the, uh, the one that started back around 19, right about the mid 90s, which was the 15 inch gauge. So for all you train guys out there, we have a lot of, we have a lot of train stories. Then you get the Alpine Slide, then you get the traditional amusement park, and then of course you've got all the businesses and the stores going in and out of there. It's a really long, it's a kind of a cute story. We're going to put it together uh, again with about 160 images. Uh, on 95 pages, and uh, we'll have several, you know, probably four or five different chapters, uh -huh. and uh, you know, and I kind of lay it out in my head, you know, and then we get, then we look at the images that we have, and the uh, some I've got, I've already I've got everything I could get out of the Denver Public Library uh, mm -hmm. files. I've already got qu quite a bit of stuff on that project right now, and then we'll come back out, you know, we'll do some interviews, talk to some of the original store owners, and um, and uh, you know, I think it's it's a great subject. It really is. It's, it's I'm really happy to do. It. I'm honored to do it. Once you finish the Heritage Square book, mm -hmm. do you already know what's next? Uh, gee, <laughs> my wife's my wife's here, so I don't know. I, you, know <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I'll tell you one thing. I would love, uh, you know, you know. I don't think anybody's really done a really great book on Lakeside or Elages. I mean, I, I I believe they, and I don't know that for a fact. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, they certainly haven't done an Images of America book, you know. And I believe there may be a couple of books out there, you know. And I'm going to research that, but I think it would be kind of cool. You know, both of those parks. I, I mean, think they've been around for a while. Our uh, population would love to see more books on, on all of our fun stuff mm -hmm. in Colorado. Mm -hmm. It's great. Bob, thank you so much for coming and sharing these wonderful books with us, especially our own Magic Mountain and soon to be Heritage Square. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you sharing these books with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it very you much. Bet. Okay, great. I'd like to thank Bob McLaughlin for being on the show with all three of his books about wonderful theme parks, especially Magic Mountain. Check your local libraries for the books that we've talked about on today's show and join us for more next time on Off the Page.